Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Daniela Cusper. I'm the Coastal Stewardship Coordinator with the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. And welcome to the 2021 Coast Watchers Training. Uh, I'm going to be going through today's training session, but I also have my colleague Alisa, uh, Alyssa on, on the call today. And um, she'll be actually taking over the role of the program coordinator for this year's season. So Alyssa, I'll just get you to introduce yourself quickly and then we can get started. Yes, uh, hello everyone. As Daniela said, my name is Alyssa Barasa. I'm uh, gonna be your main form of contact this season and I'm the one um, you've been emailing with this past month. So I'm a coastal stewardship technician at the Coastal Center. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I graduated from Dalhousie uh, about a year ago and I have a degree in environmental science and sustainability. And I am Zooming everyone from uh, my family farm and Ben Miller. So it's nice to see so many of you on and I'm sure we'll be chatting lots this season. Excellent, thanks Alyssa. And I hope, I'm, I'm sure it's good to put a face to the name uh, as well. And, and Alyssa will be emailing, will be taking over kind of the email and responding to all your inquiries uh, this year. So this year's program is generously funded by the uh, RBC Tech for Nature uh, program, as, long, as well as Bruce Power, who has funded this program for a number of years. Um, and we also have newly new to this year, Toyota Bosco Canada as well. So for those that are hearing about the Coastal Center for the first time, we were established in 1998 with the goals of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment. And we do that through education, through restoration and uh, research projects. Now the Coast Watcher program itself was launched in 2005. So we're now kind of in the program's teenage years as we uh, develop that long-term data set from shoreline observations and from shoreline measurements. The program uses a citizen science approach, which means that it's kind of a volunteer approach to collecting scientific data. And each year's data is shared with provincial and national databases where possible. So for example, the Invasive Species Center, uh, National Heritage Council for, um, for Species at Risk, but the results also provide our coastal center with direction. So for example, it could, uh, one actually one of the main reasons that we started monitoring for plastic pellets and for plastic was um, we were finding a lot of those uh, kind of microplastic turtles okay. washing up onto the shore. Okay, love you. Okay. In Goderich. Uh, so this, this program is meant to adapt with new findings and new data. So. Uh, each year, as we get data, we kind of sift through that um, and see if there's anything new that's popping up that we should be made more aware of and kind of see if our pro we can direct some of our programs or beach, whether it be beach cleanups or our Green Urban Champion uh, program to some of the new data that's, that's, that we're finding and that our coast watchers are finding. So we are seeing more of an interest from coastal communities in collecting and contributing to scientific data. We're also seeing that a lot of coastal education and awareness is desired. Um, that might be folks, more folks moving to the coast um, uh, or, or more folks settling down permanently on the coast as well. So this year, uh, there's a little graph here showing what, from when we started to where we are now. And this year we're actually at around, I think 160 or 170 Coast Watcher volunteers. Uh, from, from Sarnia to Southampton, up into the Bruce Peninsula, and we have a lot of newcomers from the Southern Georgian Bay shoreline, which is also super exciting for us as well. And so here's a map of the Coast Watcher volunteers from last year. So you can see where there's concentrations in volunteers, where there's maybe some gaps. Um, some of the times folks uh, stay on uh, but they, they took a year of hiatus, so they decide, you know what, this summer's a little bit too busy, so we're, we're going to pass on that summer. So that is an option uh, going forward, and um, that, uh, that's not reflected necessarily in, in these numbers here, who was, um, who was on hiatus or not. But you can see that we used to have some folks in the Tobermory, Bruce Peninsula area, um, and it sounds like from the chat there that we actually have some folks there joining us today, so that's really nice to see. And kind of the Meaford area, I think. We have some folks on online from there as well. 
So as a volunteer, all the important information uh, regarding to the program and the training is going to be on the Lake Huron website. So this is the website that's kind of your go-to, uh, lakehuron.ca slash coastwatcher training. Um, and on there, you're going to find the monitoring protocol. That's There's a screenshot of it on the right-hand side. And that has all the detailed information with photos to help you with your monitoring um, and with the field data sheets, which I'll go over today. Um, today, I'm going to be using a lot of that protocol. But again, uh, if you would like to go through the, the protocol itself, I think I might be able to. Alyssa, can you see my web page here? So yes, this is yes, the web. perfect. So this is the website here. So once you get onto our website and you go under programs, Coast Watchers training, and this is where that brings you. <clears throat> so the monitoring protocol is on the right hand side here. You can click the image and it'll actually open up a separate window with a PDF of the monitoring protocol and you can download that. You can print it out if you're so keen. Um, and then our field data sheet, if you scroll down, our field data sheet is the image here. You can click on that as well, and it will download for you. We also have an Excel version of the field data sheet, and I'll get into that a little bit later when it comes to actually submitting the data. And then you'll see that there's the volunteer liability and information release form. Um, I think for the most part, uh, most folks on the on the call today have already been through this process and filled this out. But just in case it is on this website, we have our compass that we can click on and print out um, and the Beaufort scale. And this is also where I'll be posting the training video. So you'll just be able to click on it and we'll rewatch this whole section. So if you need to uh, need to go back and listen to a particular part that I spoke about, the video will be a YouTube video and it will be embedded here and the slides will be posted right underneath. So again, lakehuron.ca slash coastwatcher training. So it's under the program section there. So hopefully that's helpful. I'm just gonna restart my presentation. So as I mentioned with most volunteer programs, there's some paperwork at the beginning and we have those two forms and most folks have already uh, filled those out. These forms will be kept confidential. Um, you will need to choose one part of the shoreline to monitor consistently. And, and we're hoping you can provide those, you can provide us with those coordinates. Again, a lot of folks have already done that. Um, I will have a slide on how to do that for those that haven't uh, decided where to monitor um, and, and maybe need some help in terms of finding the coordinates. And as a Coast Watcher, you're assigned a unique Coast Watcher number. So that can be CW100. CW98, um, and that will be used throughout the program to tie all of your submitted data to your specific site, to your specific coordinates, and it's just to keep a little bit more of that anonymity um, as well. And for those that are borrowing equipment, we do have a new policy this year for the Kestrels, which are the wind speed measurement devices. Um, but generally speaking, whatever equipment that is borrowed it could be the pool thermometers or like I said, the Kestrel um, that will need to be returned when you're no longer able to volunteer. Um, now, if you're volunteering for, uh, you know, you're coming back next season, then we just um, we just keep the, the equipment till next season. It's more that if you know that you're, uh, you know, heading out or, or leaving the program for, for good <laughs> um, or at least a year or two. Some folks have come back after a couple of years as well, just um, had some other things on the go. And so um, we're just trying to keep a little bit better track because as a not-for-profit, uh, we do get funding for this equipment. But again, um, for it, if we lose them, then uh, folks don't have the same opportunity going forward. And so for health and safety, when you're going out onto the shore, it will be important, especially nowadays, to stick to the Ontario public health and the local guidelines, be it physical distancing, mask wearing, following beach closures as well. We'll see if those end up um, happening. I know last year around this time, we had quite a bit of the public beaches closed, but I think we're, we're okay so far. It's just a matter of not congregating in the areas. Um, 
And basically you pick one day and one time a week to monitor, even if it's raining or even if it's snowing, um, as long as you feel safe to do so, uh, going out to monitor that one day uh, and, and time a week. One thing I would stress though, is to not monitor during a thunderstorm and to not go in the water if you feel unsafe. So we do have a part of the uh, monitoring where you, you'll do uh, water temperature measurements. And so you do need to go in the water for those. And if you feel unsafe or if you don't feel like and, and don't want to, to do those measurements, um, I'll, uh, in, in a couple slides, I'll show how to just mark that and, um, and move on to the next piece of data. So you can scope out your beach and choose a time of day that you're monitoring the site. Um, maybe choosing a, a time that's a little bit less crowded that might be tricky in the summer. I'm sure there's going to be lots of folks uh, from urban areas and elsewhere coming out to, to enjoy the lake after being kind of cooped up because of COVID. Um, but keep yourself safe, bring hand sanitizer, choosing a, a monitoring buddy could be a good idea with your household. Um, and that's just in case if you fall or if some accident happens, it, it is nice to have a buddy or someone that knows where you are. Um, cell phone, keeping your cell phone with you if you have one. Although in some areas, cell phone reception is not always the greatest at the lake. So just um, keeping that in mind that relying on a cell phone for assistance, um, solely up for, for uh, assistance may not necessarily be the best. Um, and just knowing that we can still make a difference and enjoy the beautiful lake as citizen science scientists at this time, but just kind of having this, um, this health and safety piece in the back of our mind. So as coast watchers, you are the eyes and the ears of the coast um, and you get to report on what you see. Well, we're not there, we're a, a small not-for-profit of, of three staff, so we can't be everywhere at the same time. So this is why volunteers are an amazing contribution uh, to, to seeing some of those trends that, were, that are happening on the shore, <clears throat> especially with a large shoreline such as Lake Huron's, uh, Lake Huron's shoreline. So, we hope that citizen scientists can do this with no bias because it is a volunteer program. Um, the monitoring season is 26 weeks long. So it starts May 1st and it's gonna go on till uh, October 31st. So we hope that Coast Watchers can commit to monitoring that same place once per, per week, ideally at the same time on the same weekday. So for example, Alyssa would go out to monitor uh, the Godrich Main Beach on Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Um, and that consistency is important because we want to capture all the weather events and climatic conditions across the monitoring season. Um, I will stress throughout the, the, this presentation that writing a zero in the field notes and in the field data sheet um, is better than leaving it blank or writing um, not applicable. Just um, so, for example, if you see zero wildlife, writing the zero. Otherwise, we can't actually use that metric for our data analysis because we, we don't know, we can't assume um, what, uh, uh, what you were, were thinking at the time of, of writing it. So um, that's if, if there's one big takeaway from today, it's, it's um, filling in the, the, data, the data sheets and, and putting a zero where, where possible. And we recognize that life gets busy and even with the best of intentions, some of the days are going to be missed. Um, so please don't fret over missing a day or two. It is a volunteer program. But if you intend to be away for many weeks, um, we do ask that you consider maybe asking a neighbor or a friend or a family member to take over your monitoring activities when you're absent. Um, if you're a seasonal resident and you can only commit to a few weeks per year, that's OK, too. Um, just let us know. That way we understand what your availability is. Um, and so when we see the data, we know why there's uh, uh, only a certain amount of data coming in. So where should you monitor? Uh, coast Watcher volunteers are gonna pick a section of the coast that's relevant for you. Most folks, again, know the area that they want to, vol to um, monitor, but there's, I think, uh, some that, that are still kind of debating and brainstorming. So for example, if you're a cottage owner, you can monitor the shoreline in front of your cottage. Um, you can go to a public beach that you visit uh, once per week um, and then select a point at that beach to monitor. 
And we ask that you choose a kind of a primary uh, monitoring location, and that's specifically for the wind and the wave data. Um, and the other observational data can be recorded kind of from 15 meters on either side of that primary location. So if this is you here in the middle, this couple um, hanging out at the beach, looking 15 meters north, 15 meters south, or east, west, whichever, wherever you are on the coastline. Um, and of course, just kind of making sure that you're not stepping on private, uh, private property. Um, and if you know your neighbors and, and they're okay with you, uh, looking and stepping there, then that's that, that's okay. Just um, being kind of uh, cognizant of that. But your atmospheric data, uh, your temperatures, your air, uh, air and water temperature, and your wind and wave data would be collected from this uh, primary spot. And then, if you're looking for wildlife or um, garbage, you would look. Uh, just 15, 10 to 15 meters on either side, just to see if anything has washed up. So this is an example site um, for those that some might recognize. It's the Grand Bend Main Beach from Google Earth. Uh, so here's the pier and then the main, main beach here. Um, and so if you're on Google Earth and you're looking uh, you're looking to find your GPS coordinates to provide Alyssa or myself. Um, you can actually go to Google Earth, find the spot that you're interested. Say you want to be actually standing a bit closer to the, to the dune grasses here. You would left click on the area, at which point um, you're going to have this box on the bottom here pop up. And those numbers on the bottom are actually your GPS coordinates, your latitude and longitude. So that's what we are hoping to get from uh, Coast Watchers when it comes to their location. And then your location description, if you care to share that with us, would be west of the pavilion at the pier uh, in the Grand Bend main beach. So um, if there's any questions on how to get those, those GPS coordinates, please do not hesitate to email, email us at our Coast Watcher email and we can guide you through it. Um, or if you know your location, we can just uh, log, go into Google and, and find it ourselves and, and see if it's the right location that you're looking for. So no worries if um, techno, uh, when it comes to technology, it's a little bit more difficult. We can, we can definitely help out there. So now to get to the meat and potatoes of the presentation, uh, as a Coast Watcher, you're gonna be filling out what's called the data sheet every time that you monitor the shoreline. So that field data sheet is available on our website. Um, if we remember back to when I was scrolling through a few slides back. Um, and if, if there's any questions on where to find the data sheet, please email us. We can send you the, the file right away or uh, we can point you to the, the uh, Coast Watcher training website as well. But you will need to print these out for those folks that would like us to print out some sheets and mail them. We can do that as well. We've done that in the past, um, but that will be need to be printed out. Um, we we are still using paper sheets for this, but spoiler alert: we are actually um, uh, looking. We'll be developing a mobile app this year, so um, please bear with us for one more year of. Uh, using paper and, and Excel sheets, but uh, we are hoping to uh, move into mobile format for those that are a little bit more comfortable with cell phones, but the paper format will always be there as well. Um, so when it comes to recording the data, if there's something that you're unsure of how to describe or how to identify something, for example, bird species, you can write down on the sheet, and I'll, I'll go through this a little bit more in a bit, but you can write down one bird species unknown. Or if you're very good at identifying birds and you, you're sure you know what it is, then you can definitely write in one bird, two birds, um, herring gulls, or whatever it is on the shore. Um, if you're, you can also take a photo if you're curious of uh, a bird or another mammal um, or even plant that you see, and you can send us that photo with your data and we can try and help identify that for you as well. But again, the rule of thumb is to just to uh, please fill out all the fields in the data sheet. And again, that zero is just as important as any other number uh, on that sheet when it comes to our data analysis. So this 
is a close-up of the field data sheet. I had to split it in two, uh, into two slides, but um, I hope it's fairly readable. Um, so at the top, there's the your Coast Watcher name and your Coast Watcher number. If you're looking to stay anonymous, the Coast Watcher number is all that we need on there. But the one thing I, I really do stress is um, the importance of filling in the date and the time. Um, and again, that's because otherwise we won't know where to put the data, um, where to put the data. So the first part of the field data sheet are the atmospheric conditions. So that's right at the top here. Um, and that's something like, is the horizon visible? Yes or no? Uh, wave height. And I'll go through each, um, most of these in, in some slides in a little bit. Um, wind direction, wave direction, air and water temperature. The next box here is the Kestrel measurements. So those are only for those who actually have the Kestrel wind speed device. Um, and then we get into our other boxes here, wildlife events, plastic watch, species at risk, algal blooms, storm damage, human activities. And then at the very bottom, we have a spot for photographs. Um, the, the name of the photograph when you attach it in your email and other observations on the bottom as well. So we have two very simple pieces of equipment, uh, the compass and the Beaufort scale. Both of these are available on the website as well. And I can uh, go back to that website at the end of, of the presentation if you'd like me to kind of scroll through that again but you can click, click on the compass on the website um, and an image will pop up and you can actually print that off to get you started. Um, and you can also do the same thing for the Beaufort scale. So we use the Beaufort scale mainly for wave height. Wave height's measured using the, the Beaufort scale. It's a standardized way of measuring wave height. Um, the scale describes wave height using descriptive words and it compares it to wind speed. So um, if I were to say that the waves look like they are at a Beaufort scale of two in Goderich, um, because there's a light breeze and there's some short uh, wavelets, someone in Meaford uh, will know what I'm talking about or what kind of waves I'm talking about um, if they were to look at the Beaufort scale. So it just kind of provides that standardization. Um, a zero would be glass smooth, kind of like a mirror. Um, great for paddle boarding. And then we get into, it, the scale goes all the way up to 12, but we rarely see those types of waves. We rarely see anything exceeding really eight or nine um, at the near shore of Lake Huron. Uh, so this might take some, some getting used to reading the waves. And if you actually, if you have a Kestrel wind speed device, or even if you sail, you might have a device on, on the sailboat, you can actually compare your Beaufort scale observations to your wind speed readings as well, if you want to kind of test your test your skills there. <laughs> um, and in the monitoring protocol, we do have photos of each uh, Beaufort number as well. So it kind of gives you an idea of what to look for when you're out on the shore. And then wave direction is measured by the compass on the left-hand side here. So wave direction can be uh, obviously influenced by wind direction. Um, again, with your printed compass or actual compass, you would point your arrow north and look at where the waves are coming from. So wind direction is measured from the direction that it originated from. So for example, if you estimate an east wind, um, that the wind is blowing from the east uh, towards the west, then the circumference degree would be uh, 90. Right here. So there's numbers associated with, with your direction here. Um, and some days, wind direction might be difficult to determine. So you can actually, I mean, there's other ways of uh, measuring wind, and it could be using a stick with a good old stick with a string. Um, any stick, any length will do. You could look at a flag uh, that's flapping in the wind if you're close by to one. Um, and for those days that there is no wind, you would simply put uh, NA not applicable in this case, or zero. 
And so a couple other pieces of equipment that we have, we have some very basic ones like the two I had mentioned, and then we have a couple, a little bit more advanced pieces. Um, so on the left-hand side, it's called, this is called a Kestrel anemometer. And it's basically a technical way of saying a wind speed meter. So the fan at the top here measures the wind speed and the little blue coil here actually measures temperature. And I believe these ones you can submerge in the water as well. So you can get both air and water temperature. Um, but since we cannot have a Kestrel for every volunteer, they're a little bit more expensive um, to purchase. Um, we also have a pool thermometer that's a little bit less expensive to purchase, but it, we can at least still get the air and the water uh, measurements. And we measure air and water temperature because even though we have, for example, um, the, the Weather Network app, which tells us our, our temperature, it's kind of a very general temperature for the region that you're in. But if you're in a cove that's a little bit more sh sheltered, uh, where you're doing the monitoring, that your temperature is going to differ um, than from someone that's at an open point. So we like to see the kind of the very localized conditions that are happening, which might get um, kind of glassed over when it comes to looking at a regional uh, temperature. So uh, Kestrels, if you are interested in purchasing one for yourself, just for um, interest sake, they, they are available online. They go for about $150. Um, and like I mentioned, you can get uh, current speed, average speed, and maximum speed on there along with uh, your temperatures as well. Neat little piece of equipment. Um, and now to move on to our quantitative measurements. So quantitative meaning something that you can measure with a number. Um, we ask that you record the direction of the wind using the compass. Uh, again, you can print that off or if you have an actual compass um, at home, that's fantastic as well. So to do that, you would point your compass to the north. So if you're between kind of the Sarnia to Tobermory shoreline, North is typically going to be to your right if you're facing the lake, and south would typically be to your left. And for those that are on the uh, southern Georgian Bay area, north would kind of be looking, standing out, looking onto the Georgian Bay, which is obvious. It's going to differ as well as you go up into the Bruce Peninsula. But um, if you have any questions about that, please email us. We can we can definitely guide you through um, through that as well. Um, you can confirm your wind direction again with a string, um, or you can even see what direction your hair is flowing or a map or a flag flapping again. So um, again, you can, in terms of recording the uh, wind direction, we do look for the degree that corresponds with the direction. So if, um, if it was west, then we would uh, look at the number that corresponds to west. And in this case, it is 270. 270 degrees. So that would be the number that you would write down in your field data sheet on the top left here where the where my red box is outlining. Wave direction uses the same procedures as wind direction, um, determining your average wave direction by observing the general direction of the waves as they wash up onto the shore. That direction is measured from the direction again that it originates from. So using your compass to estimate that uh, degree. We're always looking for the number for the degree. If you happen to put, um, if the, it's hard to read the, the, uh, the numbers and you want to approximate at Northwest or North, not, not a huge deal. We do end up uh, converting it, but uh, we do look for the, for the degrees. And one thing that's kind of interesting here is that wind direction, well, sorry, wave direction actually uh, affects the transport of sediments, it affects uh, the transport of nutrients and debris. So when we have wave activity moving, it, it moves sand along the shore and it can actually resuspend it in the water. Um, an example of why this is important, for example, E. coli that lives in the sand can be resuspended in the water with that sand. And so as your strength of waves increases, so does the amount of that resuspended material and resuspended uh, sand which can also lead to resuspended bacteria as well. So kind of an interesting um, reason as to why we, we look at uh, that. So our Coast Watchers monitor air and water temperature. Um, all our temperatures will be reported in degrees Celsius. Uh, temperature is the measurement taken most 
by most environmental monitoring programs, recording that temperature creates kind of a complete picture of the conditions at the sampling site, um, at, the type, at the time of the monitoring, and then over an extended period of time as well. Um, while it can be one of the easiest measurements to, uh, to get, it is also one of the most important parameters because we actually, um, we test um, the temperature affects the, the rate of various chemical and biological reactions within the water. So um, for future analysis, we hope to be able to do even more with, with the data that we're collecting as well. If you have a Kestrel wind meter, um, there is, as I mentioned, a thermometer built in. So you can actually use the number that it provides you on the screen as well. Um, if you need help navigating the buttons on the Kestrel, feel free to reach out to us as well. We're actually, I'm hoping Alyssa or myself can make a little bit of a video as to how to use the Kestrel wind meters as well, just a kind of a short snippet. So um, when we do that, we will share that with you as well. Um, and if you don't have the Kestrel, then the pool thermometer will be great as well. Um, and for the, uh, for the pool thermometer, we do uh, say to look for the air temperature first before submerging it for the water temperature, just to get a bit more of an accurate reading. And so for the water temperature measurements, um, here we have a coast watcher uh, getting ready to walk into the water a bit. Um, and he's got both a Kestrel and a thermometer. I think he was actually comparing the, uh, <clears throat> the measurements, sorry. So you wade into the water to a depth of approximately one meter. So that can be uh, your belly button or perhaps that's a little bit higher for some folks and you would hold your thermometer by the string so that it dangles halfway between the top of the water and the bottom of the lake, at which point you're gonna hold it for 60 seconds and then bring that thermometer just below the surface and quickly uh, take that measurement, um, the water measurement without removing the thermometer from the water and again, recording it in Celsius. So if, you're un if you don't feel uh, comfortable taking a water, measure water temperature measurement, um, not to fret, not a worry. Um, you would just re either let us know via email or um, simply um, putting not applicable or will not will not be monitoring for water temperature in the box, and that way we at least we just know um, we just know what's what's going on with that measurement for that data sheet. Perfect. And so for our wind measurements. Sorry about that. Um, for our wind measurements, and we'll make a video of this as I mentioned, but you would uh, face your kestrel into the wind. You would hold it in front of your body um, with the little spinning fan looking out towards the water um, parallel to the ground. And you're gonna actually wait for one minute to allow that instrument to capture the accurate measurements. And so it's gonna record the current wind speed in kilometers per hour, the average wind speed and also the maximum wind speed. Um, the instrument displays different icons for each measurement, so you will have to toggle the buttons to change the display. Um, and as I mentioned, we will kind of do a little bit of a close up video of that. Um, but if the measurements, if the instrument's not showing in kilometers per hour necessarily, then there's, there's a, a way to hold the middle button. Um, pressing the left or the right toggle until we can get the proper unit, which would be kilometers per hour. So if you need assistance with this as well, if you have a Kestrel, please email us and we'll, we'll guide you through it as well. And visibility. So visibility is assigned, uh, defined as the measure of the distance at which an object can be clearly recognized. It affects boating, it affects road traffic, aviation, and a bunch of other daily activities. Um, it can be recorded over time, and it can be used to assess um, some important atmospheric conditions. So we look at the horizon between the Earth and the sky, and um, on a, on, we look out onto the lake on a clear day, you'll be able to see the horizon. And if the atmosphere is holding some moisture um, and the horizon's hidden behind that, that fog or that haze, or if there's, there's a storm appro approaching as well, you won't be able to see the horizon. So it's basically a very simple uh, check mark. Yes, the horizon is clearly visible. No, the horizon is not visible. So here are some Beaufort scale examples. 
Um, so you'll have to select the appropriate number. So it goes from one to 12. Again, keeping in mind that on Lake Huron, we likely don't see those, those eight, uh, eight uh, scales, eight plus on by the near shore. Sometimes having that wind speed can assist, but uh, make sure to confirm the number by ensuring the descriptions that match um, that match the appearance of the waves. So you can go through these photos um, in the monitoring protocol as well if you need a little bit more time to, to look at them. Um, but for example, for Beaufort scale run, one, ripples but no wavelets. Uh, if we go down to number four, you'd see small waves and some white caps appearing. And then for the for Beaufort scale six, larger waves and many of them having white caps. So algae is one of my, uh, is an area of study, uh, academic study. So I always enjoy looking at the data that we get from this metric. We can actually compare some of the findings that we get to health units. We can look at beach closures as well <clears throat> and see if there's more uh, algal uh, findings or algal events on the shores of Lake Huron. So he, here you'll be taking an estimate of the algae if it's present um, on both the land and the water. So you'll see on your little field data sheet, it just says visible, yes or no. And if it is, estimating the length and the width um, of the algae. This is kind of an extreme example from, oh, I think it was 2005. Um, that we had, but uh, on Lake Huron, we haven't seen anything this extreme here, but typically you'll see this kind of in the water um, clumps of algae. You, you might see a film on the top of the water, or you might actually see it mixed in with the water kind of like pea soup, but um, uh, we definitely don't have any uh, or, or as extreme algal bloom events as folks do on Lake Erie um, and knock on wood for that one but it is important to gather this data just to see if there are more um, happening. And then if so, are they related to the temperature, to the wind, to the storms that we're seeing? So um, lots of data analysis that can be, that can be had from, from the measurements that you're taking. So very important data to, to be, uh, that you're gathering as coast watchers. And next up, we look at plastic pollution. So, Obviously, plastic pollution is very, it's a hot topic right now. Um, and, and most of us are becoming very aware of the effects that it's having on wildlife and on ecosystems. Um, there's a few different type, types of plastics we can find on the shore. It can be microplastics. So they're uh, technically smaller than five millimeters, very small. You might see um, something called uh, nurdles as well. So they're the pre-manufactured uh, pellets. Of, of plastic, we see them quite a bit in the Cove and Goderich, um, just because there's there's the groin and they kind of concentrate in that area when when the waves and the wind pushes them. Um, then we have some medium sized litter that can be easily picked up, um, and then we have some larger debris that washes up on the shore, be it tires, be it picnic tables or boats. I'm sure. Um, everyone's seen some pretty interesting stuff after uh, in the spring and, and in the fall, especially. So this data lets us see when and where beach cleanups are needed or if a beach cleanup was done. So that is a part of the, um, part of the question, was a beach cleanup done, yes or no? And if so, an approximation of how much litter was removed. Um, no obligation, but it is in there just in case uh, you decide. And one thing to note, here is that um, we, we do see a lot of kind of wash ups of, of dead animals and stuff like that. So those are actually recorded in our uh, wildlife section, which I think is next or in two slides um, and, and not this section. So this is strictly for plastic and uh, any kind of other litter that you see. Next, um, habitat alteration. So this can actually be recorded on the bottom of the sheet under other, other observations. Um, it can be anything from off-road vehicles. So sometimes we see ATV tracks uh, on the shores um, or, or vehicles right on the shore uh, in some parts of the shore still. Um, it can be vegetation clearings. So that's important because there are some municipalities that have tree cutting bylaws on the shore. 
Um, it can be also shoreline construction. So uh, for example, like those, those newly built stairs that we have a photo of there that typically needs a permit to be constructed. And very important to note is that we don't actually, we do not report any of these to any authorities, we're a non-regulatory organization and we use this data to see if there's a trend uh, on the shoreline. So is there a trend in shoreline residents developing more on the shore, be it armor stone, be it steel walls, be it, be it new stairs um, or, or vegetation clearing. And then we try to analyze as to why that happens. Is it, is it as a, uh, an effect from high water levels, high water impacts? Is it um, you know, a demographic shift in folks coming down here for, and, and kind of changing the shore a little bit to, to suit the needs, not necessarily maybe knowing how it's impacting the coastal, the, the coastal ecosystem or, or the bluffs or uh, the shore that they're at. So we just kind of a very important to note, note that we don't re report any of these. It's, it is more for in-house data analysis and to see any of those, those new trends coming out. <clears throat> Human activities. So that is another box kind of closer to the bottom here. And again, we look at uh, people on the beach, whether there's uh, motorized activity, uh, uh, non-motorized in the water, be it uh, folks with kayaks or paddle boards, or maybe it's becoming more of a, um, uh, you know, uh, sea dew activity out on the shore. Um, we know that we've seen a, a lot more folks enjoying the shore with sea dews kind of in, from the Sarnia to Tobermory, um, Sarnia to, I would say, kind of Salvo Beach even, um, folks getting out and enjoying. Uh, versus simply just taking out a kayak or, or taking out um, your, your paddle board. So again, interesting stuff to kind of see how our shore is changing, but also how we're changing, how are our activities changing. So um, again, we're not reporting any of this, simply observing to see if there's any new trends. And if you wish to take some photos, so these are all photos that were submitted by Coast Watchers. We just asked that you please be respectful of the folks on the shore and, and kind of taking them as far as possible um, so that you're not able to see anyone's face in there as well. <laughs> and wildlife events and species report. So that's another one of our boxes. Um, this is also a very interesting data set that we look through and we see, we actually get a lot of photos of wildlife reports, both animals that are alive and not alive, as you can see in these photos. Um, on the slide, we tried to track what types of species we're seeing on the shoreline, if there's major die-offs um, of certain species. If there are, if there is a major die-off, we do uh, like to report that to de the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, and we also try to keep track of species at risk. So we've seen a lot of uh, monarch butterflies on, on the shores. And um, I think that's a photo, unfortunately, of one that's not alive, but a photo of a monarch butterfly in the sand there as well. And again, if you if you don't uh, if you you see some birds on the shore, be it gulls, um, you can kind of estimate how many are on there. But if you don't know what type of gull it is, don't worry about uh, uh, trying to ID it. If you would like to take a photo and send it in to get some help. Um, that's a okay. There's also a lot of other websites, uh, resources for guides as well that I'll um, that I'll leave uh, the links on our website as well if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about what's what type of animals and plants are on the shore. Um, and storm damage events. So that's been an active data data set over the past two years with the high water levels especially kind of, again, in the bluff regions of Lake Huron that, that we're in here. Um, and so here we're looking at, uh, in this box, we're looking at large natural debris, large human-made debris, if it's visible, and then erosion or beach terracing. So there's different types of erosions as well. It could be kind of cut off, like on this photo here, um, or you might have the opposite. You might have a beach that's actually taken in a lot of new sand, um, new supply of sand. So we want to capture that as well, not just erosion, but also if there's, um, if there's new uh, sand as well. So an interesting fact for, for the folks on the, 
uh, kind of Goderich South, Goderich and South on, on this shoreline here, um, a lot of the bluffs that are eroding around Goderich, around Bayfield are actually feeding that sediment that's eroding away is actually feeding a lot of the beaches south of us. So kind of Grand Bend, um, Ipperwash area, um, Pinery, Provincial Bark. So um, there's there's a reason there's a lot of really good beaches there because we're, we're, we're sending along some good sediment and good sand for the folks um, to our neighbors down south. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about coastal species, there's, like I mentioned, there's a lots of guides out there. We haven't uh, done a, a Lake Huron um, animal guide. We do have a coastal plant ID guide uh, on our website, which I can also leave the link for after. Um, and we're in the process of revamping it. So we, we don't have hard copies right now because we're trying to modernize it, but um, that is there as well for plants, but for animals and, and reptiles and amphibians, there's Ontario Nature, there's the link is here. For birds, there's eBirds. Um, Mammals iNaturalist is a really good cell phone application that you can use. And there's even one for bumblebees, um, bumblebeewatch.org. So there's, I'm sure there's so many more that I wouldn't be able to fit on this slide, but, uh, and if you have any other suggestions, feel free to email us as well. Um, but we, again, we're, um, if you're, if you're unable to identify something, feel free to take a photo, or if you know that it's, you know, that it is a frog um, and not necessarily the species, you can just write down one frog species unknown. And that's, that is a-okay for us. And then species at risk. So species at risk are animals and plants in Ontario whose populations are endangered or they're threatened. Um, some of the ones that you might notice are uh, piping plover or the monarch butterfly. Um, there's so many more. Uh, snapping turtle is actually special concern. In fact, if you see any turtle uh, on the shore, most except for the painted are on the species at risk list anyway. So um, chances are, unless it's a painted turtle, it, it is something that is at risk. But again, taking a photo is always great um, because then I can use them in uh, the future training pre presentation slides as well. So uh, we always enjoy seeing photos of, uh, of what you're seeing out there. Um, our most identified species at risk has been the monarch butterfly and the piping plover. And we actually send this information to a provincial database that tracks their population. So that both that <clears throat> data that you're collecting is going towards uh, another national larger database. And invasive species, we don't actually have a box for it under on our field data sheet, but you can put it under the other observations um, at the very end of the, the field data sheet. Um, most popular along the shoreline that, that we see, at least on the southeastern shore, uh, Phragmites, which I think is pretty prevalent in some, in some places in the southern Georgian Bay area as well, garlic, mustard, and there's, there's many, many more. Um, again, our coastal plant ID guide will help you kind of uh, uh, learn a little bit more about what's, up, what's at the shore. Um, so I can send that link as well to everybody. And we send that information to the Invasive Species Center, which is a provincial database that uses that data. Okay. So now that we have all this data, how do you submit it? You can record your observations in the field on the data uh, field sheet that I've been going through. Um, you can return to your uh, computer and input that information into a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, <clears throat> which basically takes the field data sheet and puts it into uh, columns in, in the Microsoft Excel. If that's too much not to worry, you can uh, take a scan or a photo of your field data sheet and email it to us at the end of every month. And that's to the Coast Watcher email. So coastwatchers at lakehuron.ca and Alyssa is gonna be monitoring that email diligently for, for your data. Uh, you can also mail your physical data sheets to our PO box. We have gone virtual. We have gone virtual. So we used to be on the square in Goderich, but um, 
our address has changed. So just an FYI for those that do remember us maybe on, <clears throat> on the square, we now have a PO box. So once a month at the end of the month, if it happens that you miss the month, um, again, not to worry, just kind of um, some folks actually send all of their data in at once at the end of the season as well. So whatever's kind of um, most convenient for yourself. But if you do end up uh, putting it into an Excel spreadsheet, just please send us the file of that of that spreadsheet. So um, again, exciting news for 2021 and that we're developing a mobile app uh, for 2022. So we just got to um, muster through this one year of, of field data sheets and hard copy sheets. And then we're actually going to move into the 21st century. So that's super exciting. And it'll be much easier to use for those that uh, already have their cell phone out on the shore. And we know that pictures, I've mentioned this a lot today, but pictures can be powerful tools to monitor our dynamic shorelines. Um, it can be anything from month to month to year to year. So there's a number of instances throughout the protocol where we ask that you can take pictures if you want. Um, and we just ask that you, and I'm, I think this is in the next slide actually, that uh, you label it. Um, uh, uh, we have a template for labeling just so that we can keep track of track of the photos but basically once you have your spot on the beach uh, you would you would take your photo from there and it's actually kind of an interesting exercise when it comes to your dynamic beach so this is i believe from our <clears throat> uh coordinator hannah hannah can and her family cottage and interesting to see the difference between 1950 1990s and then 2018 in terms of water level and that's their boathouse there their older boathouse in the back um, as well. So changes in water levels was kind of very interesting through through photo monitoring. And then, you know, when your children or your grandchildren or neighbors want to see what the shore looked like, this is a very um, great visual to have. Because a lot of the times we have folks moving to the shore that are new and haven't had a chance to see the changes in the water levels. So again, a very great way to kind of um, get to know the history of, of your shoreline. And so when it comes to saving the photos, we have uh, a little template here. If you could uh, follow as closely as possible, post washer number, your year, month, date, and then a photo number. And so that can be anything from the algal blooms to plastic pollution wash-ups, to storm damage, or uh, species that you'd like help uh, in identifying as well. Or if it's just a really beautiful sunset and you really wanna share it, or a storm coming in, just hopefully you're not there during a storm, feel free to take a photo of that as well. We do try to post some photos on our social media as well. Um, and if uh, you're interested in us having your, your Coast Watcher number in there to keep it anonymous, then that way we can give some credit to our Coast Watchers as well. Um, so just sending that in via email to our Coast Watcher email would be fantastic. And so a quick overview at the start of the season, we start on May 1st. Um, if you haven't confirmed your participation, please let us know. <clears throat> Ensure that all of your forms have been submitted and are up to date. I think that's pretty good for most of us here today. Um, look for an alternative Coast Watcher to help with monitoring if you're planning to be away. Ensure that your equipment is working and then you have enough field data sheets for the season. And then at the end of the season, on uh, October 31st, submitting your uh, either your spreadsheet or your data sheets. Again, you can do this at the end of the season or you could do it monthly as well. It, um, for us, it helps us monthly because then we can start to input that data and then we're not left with kind of a, a very big data set at the end of uh, October. But whichever is, whichever is convenient for you is good for us. Uh, submitting your photographs, and then completing a quick Coast, while, uh, Coast Watcher evaluation, just kind of your thoughts on the program as we try to um, really move this program forward um, in the next year. And one last thing before I finish up here, we have an exciting Coast Watcher webinar series that's free, that's coming up. So if you have um, some extra time and you're, you're interested in learning about one of these subjects, we have our first ones on May 11th, and that is called Breaking Up with Plastics. So we're going to look at uh, plastic pollution in Lake or in and around Lake Huron and its impact on shoreline ecosystems and, and wildlife, what we're doing about it, um, 
Then on June 11th, we're going to look at living shoreline. So we'll talk a little bit about coastal processes, sediment transport, um, and kind of the give and take between the lake and the land and how, and how uh, the two are connected. Uh, shoreline development on June 29th will actually be, uh, if you're interested in uh, a shoreline project, be it building stairs or being or putting a shed in or a gazebo in, who, where to start when it comes to that kind of project, who to call, who, what kind of jurisdiction is responsible for what. There's sometimes a little bit of confusion about that. So I'm gonna walk, walk us through what some of the, what to um, be prepared for, what kind of questions to ask if you're going into a conservation authority to ask some questions. So, and then July 20th, we'll look at coastal plants. So I'll actually bring some, plants in from the field at that point and pull them up to the webcam. Uh, and on August 11th, 10th, we'll look at uh, some of the shorebirds that we have on Lake Huron and uh, species at risk is what we'll find, what we'll finish up on in uh, at the end of August. So I hope that uh, we see some of you there to register. It is free. We just kind of want to, uh, are looking for an RSVP and that's through our website under the events tab as well. And uh, otherwise please look out in the newsletter and we'll have a little bit more information on that so with that um our website is a great resource uh coast watcher training website is a great resource as i had here before and uh the email should be Alyssa's email should be here it could be on the main coast watcher page as well and we do have we'll actually be uploading our annual reports from last year as well. So if you'd like to look at some of the data from the years past, it will be on this main Coast Watcher page as well. So lots of information there and um, thank you for listening. <laughs>